that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for this opportunity. It's really nice to kind of uh, step outside uh, the, the ceramic realm and, uh, um, you know, uh, really kind of collaborate with people outside my, the, the comfort zone that often tends to be where artists uh, keep themselves. And so um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to kick off here. Let's see if the technology works. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Here. Let's see what it is. Transition slideshow. All right, perfect. All right, so yeah, so um, uh, this presentation is basically, um, it's based on uh, my experiences over the last uh, six or seven years. Um, uh, I, I'm a traditionally you know, a, a potter. Uh, that, that was where my background was coming out of high school and into undergrad. Uh, but then as I kind of uh, pursued uh, those endeavors, I became started to identify more as a, a ceramicist, uh, moving away from utilitarian work, but then also uh, came to see myself as a materialist. And so um, really my passion was more about uh, sourcing materials, uh, processing materials, and really kind of getting my, my hands into uh, clays and rocks and other things like that. And, and this obsession with um, how the materials looked uh, when I was working with them, and then as I, as I tried to uh, make uh, ceramics and, and, and fire them and, and, and turn them into to objects, uh, they would lose so much character, the character that I found uh, the, when they were in situ or, or in the place where they were being sourced, whether it was on the side of a hill or, um, you know, in a gravel bed. And so I really, uh, as I got into grad school, started to pursue um, uh, material literacy and, and understanding these materials. And that um, uh, in order to do that, I really uh, needed help because, you know, I was an artist, I wasn't a scientist. And so um, I started stepping outside my normal circles of, of interacting with other potters, other scientists, other artists, and then really kind of um, picking up new friends and, and, and making these connections uh, uh, with, with, with scientists, uh, namely uh, geologists and uh, uh, soil ecologists and um, this really great exchange of, of, of uh, knowledge and also just appreciation. And so um, th that's really what I'm gonna talk about uh, here in the next 10 minutes is just uh, my experiences uh, doing collaborative efforts uh, with, uh, with scientists and, and science students. And uh, you know the, the things that we kind of uh, achieved and, and also uh, gained from each other. And so um, th this picture here uh, in this first slide is, I, I grew up in Flagstaff in Arizona. Uh, I went to the Grand Canyon as a child many times. And so uh, my roots are, are very much tied to the geology uh, and the sciences. And then I kind of carried that forward um, as I moved into ceramics. And so um, a lot of uh, my history in, in, in material literacy and uh, interdisciplinary education started with uh, uh, my master's degree. Um, I um, chose Montana State University because A, uh, materials, there are so many clays and soils and, and rocks um, throughout the state. Um, and the ex they're very accessible. That was something I really wanted to focus on was uh, going to a place where the clay was literally, you know, it, it was at my feet. And um, if I wanted to source materials, I could just you know, hop off the side of the road. I was that crazy guy with a bucket on the side of the road that everybody would drive past and, and, and like, oh, who's that guy? And, and so um, I also, uh, while I was there, uh, I was building kilns, like the small test kiln. Um, I was uh, uh, experimenting with different types of materials, uh, including uh, different types of plants, like how I could fire uh, invasive species and other um, uh, weeds uh, that were not indigenous to the area. Uh, they, were, they were free for the taking and uh, a lot of them were very silica rich. And so I was using them, essentially just stuffing them into the kiln and as they would fire off, um, a lot of the materials that were left over after they were burned would then transfer to the work and so you would see buildup of silica glass on the pots. And then also um, it was a way of, of kind of finding use for these materials and, and incorporating them into the conversation that I was having uh, about sourcing local materials. And, and that was something else that I kind of was working through in school was uh, what, what is local, uh, what is, um, I, I try to stay away from the term indigenous um, and, and really kind of focus on uh, uh, that idea of uh, like localized materials um, even though I did find myself traveling throughout the state looking for specific uh, things like uh, kaolins and other types of rock. 
And so uh, the school is very open to that type of experimentation and also uh, those collaborative efforts between the art department and then the other departments within the university. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that they had started was the International Wild Clay Research Project, uh, which focused on pairing uh, art students uh, mainly ceramic students with uh, uh, students and uh, educators from the different uh, programs, including geology, including soil ecology, and how we could bring together this collaborative effort um, and, and, and really kind of shine a light on a lot of the natural resources that are found throughout the state. And then not only the, the natural resources, but also talking about some of the history of Montana. Montana has a lot of really dark history, um, you know, copper mining, um, you know, there's a lot of super fun sites in the state uh, and there's a lot of um, kind of like negative history around the way that the state has used their natural resources, the way they've exploited even uh, their human resources uh, through mining endeavors. And so uh, it was a really great platform where we were all encouraged to work together uh, while I was in school there, I wrote a grant where I was able to pay two different professors, one from soil ecology, a gentleman by the name of Tony Hartshorn, and then my uh, uh, one of my professors, Josh DeWeese, and pay them so that we could teach a collaborative class where we paired up soil ecology students and then also art students and then took them out into the field. And there was this wonderful exchange of knowledge between the two groups where you know, the soil science kids were seeing um, clay from a completely different perspective through a different lens. And then the art students, um, they, we were achieving a, a new level of, um, I use the term material literacy, understanding uh, the clays, uh, how they're formed, uh, why they exist in the places where they're found. And, and so it was a really great kind of meeting of the minds. And uh, it, it was, it was, fantastic and I think everybody really walked away with something new uh, and uh, it was a really valuable experience and it culminated in, in a thesis show and so by the time I was done with grad school I'd really moved away uh, from like the util utilitarian work there on the right uh, a, a small bottle that was fired with uh, a local clay and uh, and just basically plant ash and then I moved towards um, really trying to talk about the materiality of clay how I find it in the, in the landscape where it's wet and it's plastic and it's got vibrant colors, but then as it's processed and dried, it loses that vibrancy and the plasticity, which allows it, it lends so much strength when the water is there, but as it dries, it becomes brittle and fragile and really talking about that duality of the material and um, trying to understand and uh, maximize its potential. And so, you know, I really walked away from uh, my master's uh, with a, a better appreciation uh, for the interdisciplinary education and, and really um, with a drive uh, to try to focus on uh, pursuing that, that marriage of that merger between the arts and sciences and how, uh, you know, for the arts, um, having that, that literacy, having that understanding of materials from a scientific platform really can lend itself to how you work with uh, materials and how they inform your practice. And then for the, the scientists, having that muse, having that creative lens that, that comes from working with artists is, is a great way to create a narrative. And I think a lot of times with, uh, with the sciences, uh, being able to you know, work with a community, work with an audience, uh, having that, that, that kind of creative muse, that way of forming a story or a narrative really kind of connects you with those people, uh, those individuals, whether they're students or even just a community, and so it was kind of, there's like this, this kind of ebb and flow between the two groups. And, uh, and you, my hope ultimately is that we're just one group uh, working together and, and, and we're getting there, but it's, it's for now, um, uh, what I saw a lot of times with uh, many different types of uh, uh, campuses and schools is uh, everybody wants to talk about STEM or STEAM. Um, everybody wants to talk about incorporating the arts, but then oftentimes there's a lack of funding or just a lack of motivation uh, it, once, besides that initial uh, curiosity. So um, I left uh, grad school with a, a profound uh, respect for the materials and, and new ambitions. And so um, some of the stuff that I was doing uh, was focusing on, uh, like I said, uh, in Montana, there's a lot of, uh, of toxic areas, uh, super fun sites where um, we've, we've abused the landscape 
and it's, it's killed us and it, it's caused a lot of damage. And so one of those places is Silver Bow Creek in Butte, Montana. And there are these massive slag walls where they were crushing the rock, uh, heating it to high temperature so that they could take the copper and silver um, out of that melt. And then they, had, they didn't know what to do with the, the slag, the leftover uh, molten rock. So they basically just poured into these molds, these huge walls. And so um, they left these walls. And uh, over time, as, as FEMA and other groups have tried to reclaim these areas, clean up Silver Bow Creek, uh, one of the, the big things that they had to come to terms with was, was the slag uh, toxic? Was it dangerous? Should it have been removed? Because there, there were miles and miles of these walls uh, that were put up. And so uh, when I got to Butte and I was looking at sourcing this material, uh, something that was really helpful was this grad student, Jenna Kaplan, in 2016, she wrote a 165-page thesis paper on the slag walls looking at their toxicity, looking at um, what inert materials were present, and I was able to really use a lot of her research to inform what I was doing with the material. And so uh, the bottle on the right is fired with slag. It's fired in a wood kiln where there's there's ash. And so as the wood burns and uh, the um, there, there are materials within the wood that then kind of coat uh, the, the pottery in kind of like an asymmetrical uh, uh, decoration. Uh, and the wood ash is volatile and it melts and it creates this wonderful aesthetic. And then something I was playing with was uh, the slag, um, looking at like what's in there, what's toxic, what's not toxic, and, and finding ways to essentially kind of create this transfer between the, these slag walls are just beautiful and, and they have so many qualities to them as they just sit out there and, and they're essentially a remnant of this industry of copper mining. And uh, what I was able to do is, is these uh, latent materials, the iron and the manganese, the copper, um, fired in certain uh, in atmospheres, you can pull those colors out of those materials. And so the bottle on the right has these beautiful reds and purples that are coming from the manganese, coming from the iron. And in a way, they really kind of speak to the original material, the slag, as I was finding it there in the landscape. And again, too, um, having this research that was done by a grad student, uh, her focus was very much from a scientific realm of, you know, is this material dangerous? Should it be removed? Um, I was able to go through her research and it informed my own practice, uh, helped me make very smart decisions. There were uh, very minute traces of lead and arsenic found in certain samples. And so it was something that I had to be very mindful of using ventilation and safe spaces. Uh, when I was firing the work, but um, a lot of times with artists, we, we jump into something, we use materials without truly understanding their impact on us because we're so focused on how we can impact through using them. And so uh, that was something that I still continue to work with. Uh, I think as an artist, um, I have learned more from having these friendships with scientists and people outside my own field than simply having conversations um, with other people within my own sphere. Uh, something else uh, I found that was very uh, exciting was uh, there was a lot more possibility once we started collaborating with, uh, with the, the science departments. Um, we, we were able to obtain Haas grants for doing SEI scans. And so we took a lot of the materials that we were using and then and, and put them under a microscope and we were able to look at them and, and taking these images and, and showing them to students and seeing, you, know, you you look at the clay in your hand, but if you look at it at a microscopic level, you can understand uh, just how uh, varied and complex uh, these materials, these soils, these clays are. And so uh, a nice thing about this is through all this, uh, this x-ray research, uh, the, the undergrad student who was working with me, Meredith, she was able to use a lot of what we did in her own thesis. And so, and she was saying that, you know, a lot of undergrad students, um, it's hard sometimes to find your own focus. You know, what are you going to do your research on? Uh, and, and it can be a little competitive because there's, uh, you know, try and find a topic that works with what you're doing. And so these collaborations with artists and art students oftentimes open up a lot of avenues uh, that you wouldn't normally think of. And so I think that was a big thing too, is, is there's this mutual kind of sharing of information. And a lot of times uh, these soil science students, these geology students um, become inspired by what we're doing with the very materials that they see on a daily basis. And so again, it was just um, 
being able to lean on this technical data, uh, allowing it to inform my practice and, and making smarter decisions about the work that I was making at the time. And another great example of this was uh, I paired up with this uh, grad student, Shannon Dillard. She had permits uh, to be, she was doing uh, uh, research in Yellowstone National Park, uh, a place where I would have never been able to source any type of material because of uh, uh, national laws and, um, and, and so uh, she had been looking at these areas in the Cinnabar site uh, in Yellowstone, looking at uh, ground coverage with uh, indigenous and invasive uh, uh, native and, and invasive plants. And she had collected all these soil samples, including this loose clay that was from a former mining site. And she had also collected a lot of plant material. And at the end of her research, uh, we had paired up through uh, that, um, that collaborative class and, and she was able to give me some of that low soil and that, that low clay soil, um, I turned it into a glaze. And she had found through her testing that because of the previous mining um, that had gone on there, there, was, uh, uh, high there were levels of, of chrome and nickel in the soil. And I was able to take that soil, turn it into a glaze, and then that chrome and that nickel actually gave it that, that vibrant green and blue color. And so it was a way of like giving um, kind of a face to her research. And so where her research was tied mostly to numbers, uh, uh, charts, graphs, all of a sudden there was this very tangible representation of the materials that she was working with uh, during her time in her own research with her masters. And it, it, was, it was beautiful. She took it to her thesis defense and it added this, um, just like another angle uh, to what she was doing and, and, and a different narrative. And I think sometimes too, uh, you know, these, these, all of a sudden you have an object and, and what can be considered a beautiful object and something for people to kind of see and, and really kind of connect with. And, and I think that that's what the arts can lend themselves to the sciences because it helps to generate a narrative that, that's appealing and it's very approachable to a larger audience. Um, and then uh, something else that I was able to do was travel down to Brazil uh, in another collaborative effort where we were doing a kiln building project, but I also had the benefit of uh, meeting a, uh, an indigenous artist. Uh, the gentleman on the right is uh, Gilberto uh, Nar Narcisco, and he lives in the Paraná rainforest, and he uh, is a ceramicist, and he sources all of his own materials from the land around him. And, and we had these incredible conversations about sustainability. And, um, you know, here in the United States, um, everything comes in a bag and all the clays, all the materials that we use in the arts in the ceramics world, it's all industrial. It's all been purified. It's all been homogenized. And it's like baking. You, you got a paper bag here and a paper bag there. And it's a scoop of this and a scoop of that. And, and we've really stripped ourselves of that understanding and appreciation of where the materials come from, what's their impact on us, what's our impact on them. And so working with him and seeing how he, he had this, this rule where he would only collect materials within a certain uh, radius of where he lived. Uh, he grew all of his own food and, and he saw it as uh, being a steward of the land. And so he really tried to focus on those materials that were close at hand and then by doing that, it informed the work that he made and the, the, the focuses that he had, uh, aesthetically speaking. And so it was, it was a great opportunity. And it was something where I think, again, um, these collaborative efforts and, and, and kind of like creating new pathways uh, in education where um, you just don't see that if you just kind of stay within your own little bubble. And so, you know, I, and, and once I was done with Montana, and I got my master's. I was very fortunate to get a job uh, as an assistant director for a nonprofit arts uh, group that was in North Carolina. And it was uh, called Starworks. And, and uh, they were taking local clays and uh, turning them into commercial clay bodies. And it was, it was an incredible place because I was exposed to so many different types of materials uh, that I could really just focus on materials that were close at hand. And so I gave myself kind of the same rule within a two mile radius, what could I find uh, that could inform my practice? And this is a great example of a, uh, this iron silicate, which was essentially embedded in a, a clay layer, a kaolin uh, in Cander, uh, North Carolina. And so the, the, the clay would fracture. And then this um, 
this iron silicate would uh, essentially precipitate through the cracks and fractures and form these small slivers of material. And I was able to take that material, process it. And then what I was really looking for, again, is, is, is like this almost kind of one-to-one -one relationship where uh, the materials that I'm finding, how can I give them a voice and, and translate them in a way to where you can kind of look at the two, uh, the finished product and then the, the raw material and, and see the raw material uh, in the finished product. And so it's, it's like, you know, this direct connection, whether it's through color or surface. And uh, it, it was um, an incredible place. Um, I don't know if anyone here has ever been to North Carolina, but it's considered the pot pottery capital of the United States and has an extensive history uh, well before uh, the formation of the United States. Uh, um, a lot of indigenous groups were using clay in the area and it, it's tied to the natural geology and, and the, the historical um, the, the geologic history of the area and uh, just the prevalence of the clays in those shale and slate belts. Um, oh, here we go. And so again, um, <clears throat> kind of something that Margaret Boozer and I have connected on is uh, talking about urban materials. Um, I, as I started to move forward with a lot of this research and, and personal practice, I, I really stopped trying to go out into the landscape and digging clay and and trying to you know moving away from these serene spaces uh, where you know you go into these beautiful areas and you get a shovel and you're filling a bucket full of material and and instead looking at places where materials are being brought in um, things like gravel and other types of sediment where they're they're being brought in and changing the landscape and you know these materials in their natural state might not even encounter any form of weathering. But then when they're, 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 they're brought up, they're crushed, they're processed, and then they're moved onto site. And then they, they continue to weather. The water comes, the water takes them away. And, and this was a great example where I was looking at uh, this, this, this shale gravel that is, is everywhere. It's seen as a cheap resource and it's, it's just laid down everywhere, but it continues to weather and, and get beaten down. And I found that it was um, a very intriguing material. I was able just to take it, sift it, uh, remove all the larger particles. It required very a little amount of processing. And uh, the, the mug on the right, uh, the top glaze kind of that, that has more of a translucentness to it is essentially just that shale with a little bit of an added flux. And so um, I found that it was a really great way to talk about these materials that we take for granted and yet have a huge impact on, on an urban society, uh, on, on our landscapes. Um, you know, gravel's everywhere and it's something that we don't think about, but it has to come from somewhere. It has to be transported. Um, it takes time and energy to process it. And it is, a it, you know, I, I say a finite material, but in terms of the energy that it takes to make these things, you know, if you're in the, the, the wrong place, gravel is incredibly expensive and hard to find, just like sand. You know, sand has become such a commodity but in certain parts of the country, it's, it's, you know, you can find it anywhere and everywhere. So, you know, really focusing on uh, looking at materials that are in my space, but also like have this, this connection to uh, cityscapes, uh, urban areas, and, you know, th these materials could, they continue to, to weather, they continue to get uh, uh, to see deposition and, and be moved by uh, the forces of weathering. And then also, too, that, that kind of tied in with uh, looking at the railroads and how um, transportation of materials and goods um, impacts our lives. And again, like, you know, th like the railroad that was right down the street from me, I used to walk this path every day and I'd be looking at these shales and these slates and these these granites. These are dense materials that come from the mountains uh, to the west uh, near Asheville and uh uh, materials that were transported and then still continue to show signs of weathering and are um, they, they are brought into the landscape and then they change the dynamic as, as some of the other presenters have shown. Um, you know, we bring in these materials and then they um, they 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 shape uh, uh, these spaces uh, for better or for worse. And I find that using these materials, um, I create better conversations than trying to find, you know, the, the perfect clay out in the hillside or out in the mountains and, and really talking about uh, these materials that are direct and, and very much within in, in my, my personal space. 
And so um, I, I, the pandemic has been hard on everybody. And uh, as, as I, for those of you who first started uh, this, uh, when we got here, uh, my, my partner and I just had a child. And so we decided to move back to Minnesota, uh, where I've, I've spent um, a considerable amount of my, my adult life and uh, uh, to be closer to family, but also um, it's, it's, it's a place where I'm very comfortable and, uh, and I, I have materials at my feet. And so again, I've, I've really started to kind of um, bring about this philosophy of, of how do I look for materials? How do I find materials? And you know, what's my carbon footprint? And that's something that I stress to a lot of people. And so I'm, I'm digging clay with a former student and this is a place where they were just digging. And, and, and I'm the kind of guy who always has a shovel and some buckets in my, the back of my car. And um, I'm also looking at this way in which we connect with community. And so how can I connect with people, have these conversations, have these interactions, and then uh, walk away with something tangible. And so I talked to this, the, the business owner, I asked him for permission. He was uh, re, he was digging on uh, this foundation and they were uh, regrading this area. And there was this beautiful glacier clay, this, this boulder clay uh, that's, that's prevalent throughout uh, the, the upper Midwest. It's a, um, uh, you know, the, the Lake Superior, you find all these red clays that exist because uh, all the basalt up north dug out and then uh, transported. And so, um, you know, materials where I didn't have to do a lot to obtain them. You know, there was already heavy equipment on site. They were already going through this process. And so it was really just connecting with the business owner. I, I took uh, probably about 300, 400 pounds of this, of this clay. And uh, th with the exchange that I would be making a mug for the guy. And so then he uh, has a mug that like is a direct uh, reference to the, the land where he owns his business. And so, you know, trying to connect people uh, with the, the landscape around them is, is something that's it, it easily it more. It's easier to obtain through th things like physical things like clay and, and, and pottery. And I find that, that that's one of the things that has drawn me to ceramics is that community connection and that way of like taking the landscape uh, manifesting it into this tangible object and then sharing that with other people. And then another aspect of some of the ongoing research that I'm doing, uh, again, is connecting with people. And then this is an old mining site uh, in southern Minnesota near Redwood Falls. Uh, and this is a, a, a bigger conversation for me now because I'm really trying to talk about the impact of mining, uh, the impact of uh, uh, material acquisition, and this is private property. It was owned, it still is owned by this, this uh, farming family. And this mining company came in and they made a lot of promises and they acquired mineral rights. And then they, they dug out this primary deposit of kaolin. It's this beautiful pink granite that weathers into a really gorgeous pure clay. And, and so they were uh, they dug all of this clay up. They dug this huge hole. They, they uh, transported it to the other side of the site. But then once the purity ran out, they started to see more and more iron uh, in the clay. And then they just abandoned everything. There's, there's equipment everywhere. There's all of this old uh, uh, processing uh, equipment, uh, uh, ball mills, just this rusting. And, and the, the attitude of the family, um, they were really frustrated. They felt that they had been cheated. Uh, and, and they saw this site as like this this eyesore on their property, something that they, they took a lot of pride in and, and felt a really strong connection. And so when I found this site, I was uh, just uh, in town connecting with a lot of the people, the locals, and they said, oh, yeah, there's this Kalen mine just down the street. And I, I went and knocked on their door. Uh, they were kind enough to let me take samples. And, and I, I made a really beautiful vase for them. And I brought it back to them. And uh, it, it was they were really amazed. They didn't they just they saw this material as a reference to like this really uh, this terrible altercation or this this relationship with this mining company. But then for me to be able to take it and then turn it into something that was beautiful and then and just a very uh, visceral, tangible example of, of what's sitting on their property. And I still visit them. Uh, and uh, I've been there twice in the last five years. And I, I usually take about as much as I need. I never try to take too much more. And uh, it, it's a really wonderful place. And uh, it's really also, I've tried to change uh, their, their mindset about uh, this, this material and, um, you know, just like put it in a better mind frame and, and see them 
to have them see that it, it's still something of, of great value. Uh, the, the, the mom is actually takes the kids and they, they, they go dig the clay themselves and they've started making pottery. And, and I find that those kind of connections and really uh, trying to get people to understand uh, the beauty of the landscape, but also just uh, its importance. And so, uh, um, you know, and that's, that's the, the, the big thing. And I think why it's, it was nice to have this platform is, is, you know, I'm, I, I want, more and more to try to connect with uh, scientists, uh, educators, and, and find ways where uh, arts can help with that narrative and engaging with communities and, and, and creating that sense of importance and, uh, and and really getting people to engage with the landscape. And it doesn't have to be these beautiful landscapes like the, the mountains of Montana. Uh, I, I work with brick dust. I work with, you know, I love, I have these what I call ditch glazes where I just go out into like, you know, like the side of the road. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's man altered materials like gravels and there's local materials and soils and they're all blended together. And you can take these things and process them and turn them into something beautiful. And then it becomes a great referent uh, to the, the materials there. And, and also uh, by educating people, you give them agency in their space and, and you, you can kind of instill this ownership by, you know, really tying in these strong narratives. And so, uh, you know, and that's, that's pretty much my spiel is uh, just uh, trying to find ways for artists and, and scientists to live in harmony and, and make this place a beautiful space. And that's it. <laughs>